Yeah. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> so I'll just go ahead and ruin all that and <laughs> preach. <clears throat> awesome. Awesome. Just don't want to talk yet. Just let it sink in. Let it sink in and, and let me not lose it. <laughs> I never saw that video till uh, Thursday. But God is good and he knows what we need to hear. And uh, man, I don't know where to start. <clears throat> go to church for a long time and you know I'm not the only guy doing this a lot of people do this and uh, how many people would say that they've heard probably a hundred sermons in their life how about 300 how about 500 sermons did you just ever think about that you ever think about the 500 number versus the way you're living right now? Does that, does that make any sense at all? That's like 500 hours of pleading to do something different. <clears throat> I'm going to do it again. So we're going to make it 501. Amen. But, but listen... I, I, I just so desperately, I've been praying today, so I shared a little bit at the beginning about I'm not satisfied, I'm so desperately desiring God. When, when we were singing just now about show me your glory, I'm like, now, Lord, now's the time, show up, do something crazy. Do something crazy so they can see that you're real right now. Now's the time their hearts are ready. They're ready to, to, be, to knock them on their fannies right now. <clears throat> And I so desperately want that for all of us, that we would truly not just hear like a word spoken to you from God's word, that you wouldn't necessarily laugh or, or I mean, you could, we could laugh, we could cheer and all that, but I so desperately just want to see, I'm a results-oriented guy and Jesus is too. He is such a results-oriented God. He wants to see you changed. As awesome as you are, and you are so awesome in the eyes of God, but he doesn't want you to stay where you're at. He wants you to be more awesomer. And so I, I just want, I want to, I don't understand prayer, but I want to pray with you in advance of me doing anything here. And I'm just, I, I'm just believing that if we, we ask him with, uh, with complete sincerity that we're like really open and really willing to let his word wash away whatever's in there right now. What, whatever, whatever it is that you think you know that you would be willing to let it go if God said so. Okay, so Father, th that's, that's where we are. Um, as our, our heads are bowed, some of us are, are lower, some of us can, some of us can't, but, but we want our, our posture to reflect where our heart is. Like we, we understand, Lord, that you made our heart, it's it's beating because you're telling it to. But we also know because your word tells us that our heart is, is deceitful and it's wicked. Like there's just things in there that are not what you want. And we feel them and we choose to obey them instead of obeying you. We understand by our words and our mind that your word is, the Bible, that that's truth, and that what we feel, unless it's lined up with that, then it's not real. Our, our feelings are not real unless they are exact replicas of, of, of your word. And so, Lord, we are literally coming before you right now into your throne room, the creator of heaven and earth, and asking you to help us to submit our stubborn selves to the authority and truth that is 
the word of God. Lord, you have a desire for these people. You have a plan for each person and a plan for this congregation. And Lord, we don't want to get in the way of that. We want to, we want to see that go from your plan to our reality. And we only do it by submitting to you. Help us to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, you're all stubborn, and so am I. And I won't call Jessica a stubborn mule because she'll get mad at me. So the rest of you are stubborn mules, and except Jessica. <laughs> well, I'm a stubborn mule too. We all are. We all are. Who likes being told what to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah right? No, no, one, no one's going to put their hand up on that one, and I don't blame you. Um, and so sometimes, uh, because God knows that, he repeats himself. We've talked about this a little bit, haven't we? That when he repeats himself, it's not because he's like, oh, man, I can't believe I just said that in Philippians. I forgot I said it in Corinthians. My bad. <laughs> like, that's, see? <laughs> so, so he repeats himself because, not because he has a bad memory, but because we do. Because we don't listen, right? So he repeats stuff. And so there's some things in Scripture that, that some repeated teachings, some repeated themes, right? And, and I kind of want to go over that with you tonight. Um, as you see behind me, there's this giant number one. So who, who started coming here since after Easter? Raise your hand. Okay, half the room. So you don't know what this one is, right? So this one, we started on Easter... Because we started this, this series within, it, it's kind of like a, it's not like Luke, like we're just going right through it, you know, it's like we're going through Luke, and then once in a while, if, if I sense that God's saying, okay, do this, we jump back to this one series. This one series was God's word telling us how we're supposed to be one body in a variety of different ways, right? So, so I shared that on Easter, and one other time, I think, since then, and it's a study of the ones, not the number ones, really, but it's the one, like we'll hear tonight. There's this overall theme in Scripture, this principle that's found over and over and over again about one. And, you know, the, it's true that you can't teach someone something that they haven't learned themselves, right? And you can't take them to a place that you've never been. And so God took me to this place this week, and as I was reading through some of these verses about us being one, um, he stirred up something fresh inside my spirit too for you, for us. And, and I got excited about it, and it was obvious that it was time to take a break from Luke and talk about this because he got me fired up about Revolution Church, and he got me fired up again about his word and, and what it means for us. And so since I'm fired up, if I love you, I want to pass that on to you, right? So you can be fired up. So I want you to get fired up, and if you get fired up, about anything you hear, I want to hear it. I want you to fire me up now. I'm going to do my best. It's a two-way street, but I want you to get fired up. I want you to get fired up about the choice, kind of, that you made to make this your church. It wasn't your choice, but you were like he was leading and you were following. And so that hand on your back, that was Jesus going, revolution, and now you're here, Right? And so I want you to get fired up about this. Here, here's some of the, this is the verses I'm talking about, okay? This is the stuff that's repeated over and over again. Things like this. Um, Philippians 1, you know, hold on, hold on. Is anyone, is everyone paying attention? Yes. No phones out right there. You don't need phones out. Unless it's on a Bible app. You put your phone away, right? I want you to pay, pay close attention to the Lord. This is an important night. It's an important night, Okay. And so I want you to grab a copy of God's Word. Don't just sit there and look at me. L grab a copy of the Bible. I want you to look at God's Word. Let him, like, I'm just going to be a mouthpiece. You guys, the old folks in here, you know how, who Howie, Howdy Doody is, right? That's me. I'm Howdy Doody. And I want God to just pull the string on the back of my head and speak His words. But I want you to see Him. I want you to see Him in God's Word. This is God's letter to you, right? It's not just to me. 
it's to you. It's not just to the preacher, right? It's to you. And so I want you to put your eyes on God's word. We're going to be kind of all over, but uh, first, first place we're going to take a look at is Philippians 127. It says, live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. L like, you're all aliens, you know that? You're all funny looking. We're, we're, no, one, no one that's a, a believer in Christ is of this earth. They make movies about us. We're weird people. The Bible would call you a peculiar, peculiar people, right? Uh, we're a strange bunch. We're different. We have a, we're different, and, and it says here in Philippians, Paul says to this church, hey, live as citizens of heaven and conduct yourselves. That means the way you act, the way you think, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, th th think about the gospel. Like, what is the gospel? The gospel is, is that you were born with sin DNA in your body that you can't do anything about, even if you act perfect and you, and, and you obey your parents to the T and you never kind of do anything wrong. If you were perfect behavior from the day you were born to the day you died, you go to hell. That's the truth because you have DNA sin. Because of what Adam and Eve did, you have it in your DNA. You have no choice. And so because the truth of the Bible says that you are dead in your sin, right? How can a dead person save themselves? How can a dead person do anything? What can a dead person do? Be dead. That's the only thing they're good at, is to be dead. And so the gospel says you're dead, so there's nothing you can do to fix this DNA, so I'm going to suck your blood out in a sense, and I'm going to put new blood in, my blood, I'll save you. That's awesome news, yeah. right? Is anyone fired up? Because yeah. I'm fired up now. I got Jesus' blood pumping through my veins. That's awesome, right? So, so the gospel is I can't save myself, but Jesus, the God-man, comes and gives you his perfection, and you give him your sin and your death, and he exchanges it willingly. That's amazing. Like that's, don't, don't treat that as common. Amen. That's the most amazing. Listen, don't be looking for miracles. That's the best one you'll ever see. That's amazing, right? You could, you could stand people up out of wheelchairs and cause blindness to go away, and they would pale in comparison to saving a dead person. That's awesome. And so in light of that, live your life worthy of that. That's awesome. Like, that's, that's insane, right? Insane. But that's not enough. He says, not only that... But in Colossians 1.10, the same guy says to another group of believers to live a life worthy of the Lord. <laughs> Not just what he did. Worthy of him. The perfect one. The holy one. The beautiful one. The one who was before all time. The one who spoke and the planets came out of his mouth. The one who walked on water. All of this, this God who created everything in light of that God. Forget if he ever, if you ever took a breath, he is God. And in light of that, live a life worthy of him. Woo! Yeah, yeah. Amen. So what he's done and who he is in light of that, live a life that is worthy of that. You gotta stop and think. Think of your life right now. Not to condemn you, to encourage you to greater heights. Yes. Yes. Listen, one of the things that makes him so incredible is that this Lord who spoke planets out of his mouth loves you. That's crazy. Did you ever go try to rub elbows with a rich, real super rich celebrity type? They don't kind of want to talk to you. <laughs> I, I go to Bay Hill and I go to the golf tournament. You know, like once a year I'll go with my buddy Bill and they have it roped off with a, because the players, they don't want to be bothered with you. You're riffraff. You're not rich like me. I'm Phil Mickelson. I'm not ripping on him. I mean, I'm sure he's a great guy and everything, but they don't, but Jesus, he's a little bit better than Phil Mickelson. Right? He, <laughs> 
But yet, right, he's, he's here right now, yeah, listening you. to you, talking to you, right? Mm -hmm. Giving you breath in your lungs. Yeah. Making your hearts pump right now. Are you doing that? No. I'm not doing that. I can't make my heart beat, but Jesus does. And that Jesus loves you. And so because of who he is and because of what he's done, feel that weight, right? So that's why Paul tells us in Romans 12, 1, I plead with you. He's pleading. Because of what he has done, give your bodies to him as a living sacrifice. This is a hard message right here tonight because what he's calling you to is so much more than you have ever given him. Right. Some of us in this room have given a lot to him, and I would include myself in that, but he is so not satisfied with that. He said, give your, I, Paul's like, I, if, if, God, if God's word is written by the Lord, but uses men to, ple, to, to pen it, right? Do you guys know this? Yeah. So then who's pleading here? God himself, who needs nothing of you, is pleading with you to give yourself to him because of all that he has done. Man. Think about that. The creator, somewhere, somewhere along the line, this got to get into you finally. Amen. This has to change who you are. You can't be the same person anymore if you truly realize what's happening here. The creator of heaven and earth is pleading with you, Ron, to be different, to give yourself completely to him. And what do we do with that? I'll give it to you on Saturday, sir. Again, not to condemn, but to encourage more because why would God plead with you for that? Why would a God who needs nothing plead with you to do that? Yeah, he can save us, but more than that. Why, 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 would he, why would he plead with you to give yourself completely to him if he needs nothing? To benefit you. To benefit you. He needs nothing. So why would he plead with you? Unless if you actually, listen up, folks. If you actually did what he said, you'd get what he gives. But we don't. But we don't. And we're like chickens on the ground accepting the nothing off the bottom shelf when all the while the king is going, take top shelf stuff. Anyone drink, any drinkers out there back in the past? There's a difference between well and top shelf, right? And we're down there sucking the empties off the well and God's like, drink the good stuff. That doesn't mean you should drink, y'all. Okay? All right, Facebook, I didn't say you should be drinking. It's, it's called an illustration. Do you ever see an old scale? You know what I'm talking about? A scale? You know, these things? So, so, so he's saying, he's going, listen, because of all this over here on this side of the scale... All this of who I am and, and what I've done for you, contemplate these things. Why do you think we take communion in remembrance of him? To remember who he is and what he's done. And so because all this stuff is over here on this side of the scale, he's like, on this side of the scale is your life. And it should be, it should be this. Boom, right here. Not like this. Balanced, right? Balanced because of all that I am and all that I've done. This is the way that you should live. This should be a, listen, a monumental shift in your life. If you truly, truly have an encounter with the living God, it will shift your life. Right? It will shift your life. I'm talking about... <laughs> The old guy's dead. And behold, there's a new person. Oh, this is what I, well, this is what I did. No, you don't. This is, what I've, this is who I am. No, no, you're not. Right? If you used to do these things, they're gone. Amen. Right? Stop rehash. Don't keep picking old wounds and digging up old bones of who, who you used to be before you got there. Amen. You leave that crap in the water. And you come up a new person, right? Things happen. You start going to church on Saturday night. 
What's that? What's up with that? You go to church on Saturday night. It's awesome. A lot of other things you could be doing. A lot of other things you used to do. You start going to church on Saturday night, listening to David Crowder. What's up? Wives start submitting to their husbands as unto the Lord in all things. Come on now, that's not that's countercultural. Don't be throwing anything at me, ladies. I'm here to tell you the good news. <laughs> this ain't Oprah. This is no ladies' movement here. God has established your value and your role, and it's not my decision to, to, to what to do with it. His word says that wives should submit to their husband in all things as unto the Lord. If you want his blessings, you follow his word. And, and, and men start, start folding up and packing up their stupid man caves, and they, and they trade in NFL Sunday ticket, and they start hanging out with their wives and realizing that she's a treasure and that she's not just a cook and a babysitter. Right? That's what they do when they become Christian men. You see? We start forgiving people of their sin. Why? Because we look in the rearview mirror, and we see the, the Mount Everest of sin that he, that he forgave in your life. So, so what is it that someone could do to offend you, somehow to offend you, that's so big that you can't forgive it, but somehow it was okay for you to receive the forgiveness of your mountain range of sin? It's different when you're a believer, right? Way different. We start praying. We start giving. We got new desires in our heart. We're different, right? Every, I, got, I used to go and I used to sell cars. I'd sell a car. And, I, and I, every time, when they were in the finance office getting ready to, to take delivery of their car, where they were in the, you know, getting their warranties that didn't cover anything, you guys know that, right? And, and so, when, when, so when I would get the car ready, I'd, re, I'd, prog- I'd pre-program every station in their car to the Z. Every single one. They get in, Z88, Z88, Z88. What the heck's going on, right? It's the Lord, right? It just things change. Things change when you become a Christian. And so you do, you have new desires that he's put inside of your heart. You want to listen to, to, to new music. You want to listen to sermons. You want to start, start going to church. You want to start reading the Bible. And it like you desire to read it. And it starts to make sense to you now when you have his spirit who, who authored it now living inside of you. It makes sense. And it's not a book of rules and condemnation. It's a book of freedom and love and hope. And you want God's word. Things change. Things change. And so I say all that to say this, that there's this reality that God's deliverance for you from, from sinner to saint, from darkness to light, from brokenness to whole, from death to life is such a big deal. That God says, because of this big deal, your life should radically change. You should, there's no way if all that that I just said, if all this gets wham into your heart, there's no way Carl could be the same person. You can't. You cannot be that same person. And when the believer is real, you don't beg him to come to church. You don't beg him to read his Bible. You don't beg him to praise Jesus. They want to do that. They are compelled to do that. They can't stop doing that. That's the real believer. That's the real believer. That's what we're looking for. Life, live a life worthy of Jesus and the salvation that he gave you. I got a, I know it doesn't sound perfect. Come, what was that next one? He tore me up. Tom comes running in the other room. Is your back out? I'm like, no, I just need to blow my nose. He got me. God got me. So there is this reality that it's a it's a huge deal, right? That what he's done for you. It's massive. It's massive. But the other reality that's found in scripture is that. Not only does he save you, but then he actually places you into his church. So now, look around. Like, you're in this, this is just one room, but now you're in this big room. It's kind of weird. You're in this big room with all these 
weird other people, right? And you're like, who? You didn't know these people just a short day ago, right? And now you're in this big room and you're trying to be like new. Like all these people are new. And, and so like, what am I supposed to do? Like, how do I pull off this new person thing in this group setting that's continually growing in number and in diversity? Like, how do I process this? I'm a new person, but I'm obviously different than you. You're a woman and I'm a man. So we're not the same. So like, how do we, but we're new. So how do we do this thing because he has called you into his church. You're part of his bride. And when, the, when it's all done, he said his bride is going to be spotless and beautiful. So we have some work to do. I'm looking out at a group right now. See, God says that he brings you into his presence as a saved one, as holy, blameless, and without fault. I love you, but I don't see you that way. You don't see me that way either. God sees me that way, but the reality is I'm not. I'm hoping that I'm progressing, right? But I still fail. And I'm not perfect. I'm not blameless, but praise God. This is a good place for an amen. That's the way he sees me. That's awesome, right? Don't, and, and if you start complaining that life isn't fair, you should shut up. You better be praising God that life ain't fair. Okay? So, 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 so he, he puts us in this room with all these people, and like, what are we going to do? Because we're new, and we're different. So how do we do this thing? Well, I want to take a look in God's Word at a group of people that, that really pulled it off well. But the thing that's really amazing about this group of people is that they didn't have what we're going to read. See, we come to church, and someone, hopefully, whether it's this church or another church, wherever you go, hopefully that man has spent a lot of time in the book with the Lord learning, and then he teaches you something. Right. That's the hope, right? But these people didn't have that when it comes to this topic of how, okay, because, they, right, this was the first group of believers, so they don't have the New Testament to look at and going, okay, well, how do we, how do we, how do we act as one? Because it's not, so we're running raw here, man. This is a new, this is a new maiden voyage. What do we do? So, so look here at Acts chapter four, just this first sentence. Um, this is one sentence in verse 32, 432. It just says this, all the believers were united in heart and mind. All of them. So, so granted, there's different people, right? I mean, people are different. Not everyone's cut out of the same pattern, right? So we're different, but it says here, all the believers were united in mind and heart. They had one mind and one heart. So that means that even though they're different, because we're all different, right? Say we're different, but we all have the same heart and mind. That means we all love just the same way. And we all uh, have passion for the, for the people and for the Lord the same way. We all believe the same. We trust the same. We have faith the same. We all have the same purpose, and we're all on the same mission. That's what it says. And why were they like this? Was it because the pastor stood up like I'm doing now and read a section of text and said, okay, this is what you do? And it wasn't like that. The reason why they did that is not because someone taught them, is because they were on Jesus' overload. Because they had spent three years with this amazing man who preached in an amazing way with authority because he actually wrote the book. Right, And he's performing miracle after miracle after miracle. The dead are rising. The blind are seeing. The sick are healed. The lepers are healed. Like all these amazing things. He took a happy meal and he fed like a huge mountain range of people. It was insane, right? So they saw this. And while he's doing all this, he's also making some promises that he's going to die. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to be whipped, beaten, killed in the tomb, rise again. Like, those are amazing promises, and then he does it. So these guys are totally freaking out. And after, <coughs> after he dies, he shows up, and he, and he starts teaching them about the kingdom of God. 
and about this Holy Spirit that's about to come and hammer their life. And so they're totally freaking out. And so as a result of this, all that Jesus is and all that he had promised and then followed through with it, what is the result of this? Well, in Acts chapter 2, it tells us that there was awe. Yeah. Over, it says, awe came over them all. Yeah. And in the awe, something happened. They weren't taught. No one said, all right, open up your Bible to this and do this. No, no, no. They were in awe of Jesus. And they figured, hey, this Jesus is amazing. I'm totally freaked out. I'm floored of who he is. And so I'm giving all that I am and, and, and all, all that I am to who he is and to what he has assigned to me. And so they were completely in awe and they gave themselves completely to him. Their old priorities, gone. Their old preferences, out the window. Their old standards, opinions, and plans, gone, gone, gone. Everything they thought, gone. And every single one of them, no matter who they were, no matter the ethnicity, the history behind them, their socioeconomic status in the, in the culture, out the window for the mission of Jesus Christ. Thank you. One of these days, I'm going to just do this in advance. <clears throat> every single person there, right? No one had their own mind and heart anymore. It says, all the believers were of one mind and one heart. And that's it. Whose heart? Did they pick the most awesome and say, okay, we're going to be like him? Kinda. But it wasn't just a dude. It wasn't like Peter or James or anything. It wasn't like that. It was Jesus. They all did it the way Jesus would do it. I think that's where the bracelets came. What would Jesus do? <clears throat> you see, there's this, there's this shroud of mystery over this, this early church. Because, you know, this, like they, they did these incredible things. And, and so many churches, including ours, look back at that and go, man, I wish we could just kind of do that, you know? But there's this shroud of mystery kind of covering the Acts church. It's not really Acts church. It's really the Jerusalem church. This is where it all started. It's just described in our history book as the Acts church, but it's actually happening in Jerusalem. And there's a shroud of mystery over the early church and how they conducted themselves and because they had this Pentecost thing, right? Pentecost is simply a holiday in the Jewish faith, but this, on this one Pentecost, and, it's, and they talk about it in Acts chapter 2, all the believers were kind of hanging out together because that's what we do. That's what we do. Yeah. And, <coughs> and so they're hanging out in this room together because that's what we do. And, and then all the people that don't do it, amen, you start, or you start that. And so they're hanging out in this room, and, and all of a sudden, um, these, this kind of freaky, these little, like little things of fire, let's, like, maybe like this or something, uh, they start dropping down out of the ceiling. And they, and, they, and they go like over, like you'd have one on your head, and you'd have one over your head, you know, it's just kind of freaking them out. And, and, and all of a sudden, the wind, like this strong wind, like we got the doors closed right now, right? So if this like 50 mile an hour wind came rushing through this building right now, it kind of freak you out, right? That happened. And, and, and look at this thing that you're standing on, right? Pretty solid, right? Like the building that they have, they, they build them out. Like they're, they don't have walls with wood. They have, their, their walls are like this. It's rock, right? And the building started to shake, right? And, and all of a sudden they start speaking in different languages because there were people all up in that room from different places. And like, how am I going to tell you the gospel of Jesus if you don't speak the language I speak? So God just gives me the ability to speak your language. That's freaky, right? And so because of all this, right, they're all fired up. And, and so it makes, it's a special event. It was incredible. It was powerful. This is what happened with these people. And so, yeah, it makes sense for them to be of one heart and one mind and totally floored by Jesus, and they're going to go all in on this thing. It makes sense for them, doesn't it? But we ain't them. We're revolution. It's 2,000 years later. It's, it's a different country that we're living in. So, so what about us? 
See, we, we haven't had, like you may have had a Pentecost moment in your own life when the Holy Spirit came and just kind of wrecked you, and that's fine. But we've never had that corporate Pentecost thing here in our room. Like it's never happened, right? And so, so if we've never had that that would like inspire us to unity and, and be of one heart and mind, like what do we do? Because we've never had Pentecost in our church. So does that mean we're different? How do we find the inspiration and the desire to be of one heart and one mind if we've never had what they had? Well, do me a favor and look in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I love the sound of Bibles turning. Do your pastor a favor and just use regular Bibles. You can use devices if you want, but that's just like, that just fires me up. I love pages turning. It just sounds so good. Listen. Ah. It's like the smell of your house being filled with lasagna when you walk home. Right there. So Philippians chapter 2. Look at the verse, first couple of verses right here. So Paul, he says this to these folks in Philippi. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together, wow, look at this, with one mind and purpose. Wow, wait a minute now. You're asking these people to do the same thing that they did in Jerusalem after Pentecost? And they didn't have Pentecost. See, this, this letter to the Philippians was written in 50 AD, give or take. So that's 15 years after that crazy night in Jerusalem and in a different country. Okay, so, so imagine Israel, right? And this kind of shaped like Israel. And you know, to the left of Israel is the Mediterranean Sea, right? And so way over on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea is where, you know, Greece would be and then Rome, the boot. The boot. Well, about, you know, up there by Greece, uh, north of it is, is that's Philippi. So it's like not even in the same place, but yet he's saying, I want you to do the same, you should be living the exact same way that the people who experienced Pentecost should be living. So, let me ask you guys, let's interact a little bit. <clears throat> Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Let me, let, let me just kind of, just briefly, like, encouragement's kind of like good news, like things are going to be good for you, right? So because you're a Christian, are you a Christian, right? I think, I, I, I know you, but not everyone here knows. This is Marie. Is there any encouragement, anything good as a result of being a Christian? What, what's good for you now? I have been able to do things that I've never been able to do before for people, and I know what my purpose is. Okay, so you got some purpose now, yeah. right? Okay, that's awesome, right? Um, how, 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 about, how about you? Is, it, what, is there any encouragement for being a Christian? Like, what's, what's, what's good that's happened that you have to look forward to? Because you're a Christian. So you, you understand the love that g the Creator has for you. Right? That you didn't know before. That's, that's awesome, right? Who likes being in love here? It's good to be in love, right? Okay, as a Christian, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you got? What's an, what's, an, what's an encouraging thing? Because you're a Christian, I... Finish my sentence. Uh, I know the next day, no matter what happens, that's good. Yes. Trust. How about this one? Because you're a Christian, you get to go to heaven. I was waiting for the, I'm waiting for y'all, right? Someone's got to say that one, right? So that's an encouragement, right? So that's good, right? So, so you got that. You got that. You got that, okay? Um, how about this one? Is there any comfort from his love? Anyone, anyone been super, super sick, but yet you knew he was there? Yeah. Comfort in his love? You got that? Does anyone ever experience that? Raise your hand. Awesome, right? That's awesome. I feel the wind blowing through. <laughs> any, any, listen, any fellowship together in the spirit? Like, are you, are you, do you feel united with God? 
Do you feel like you, you've become part of who he is? Like, because the Bible does say that you're in Christ, right? And that he seated you, listen to this one, he seated you in the heavenlies with him now. Not later, now, right? So has anyone ever felt that truth? You feel it now? That's the building shaking. You're having Pentecost, okay? This is the truth, okay? Now, what else? How about this? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Now, before you answer that, <laughs> I can just tell you that I'm a work in progress, but I'll be the first one to say that before I said yes that day at Chili's, that was not me. A tender heart and compassionate. I'm barely that now. So, so let me ask you a question. Just, let's just be honest in church. Okay, before Christ, this is not to brag or boast because we should not boast about anything except the Lord. Before you came to Christ, would you say your heart was tender and compassionate? Raise your hand if you thought that was you. Okay. I appreciate honesty in church. Now, again, not to boast, and I'm not saying that you are compassionate and tender, but are you, since becoming Christ, not becoming Christ, but be, becoming a Christian, would you say your heart is now more tender and more compassionate toward others than you were before? Raise your hand. So you've experienced Pentecost. Do you see? So because of that, again, Paul's penning, but who's the author? God. God. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Do you see this? The one? Agree, right? Throw your stuff out the window. All me. Loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. You see? Now, <clears throat> that's cool. That's who we're supposed to be. That's, that's not the people in Jerusalem at Pentecost. That's the people in Philippi. Oh, but that's not all. See, this is an overall theme in Scripture. Be, and, and Paul says it again to the, to the folks in Corinth. See, five years after he writes the letter to the Philippians, he writes another letter to the people in Corinth, right? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, also modern-day Greece, way far away, not in the same area, now, 20 years later, he's, he writes a letter to these people. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, he says this. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have to stop there for a second. Everyone should be listening right now, right? The authority, so Jesus Christ, the, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who, 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 everything was created by him and for him and all things are held together in him is telling Paul, I want you to say this. So we should be listening. And he says, on the authority of Jesus Christ that we are to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of, what? One mind, united in thought and purpose. Let there be no divisions in the church. That doesn't mean divisions like we have now. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, you, half of you guys get mad at me and to start, decide to, to start a, another church down the road. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. In this case, he's talking about our minds, our thoughts, and our purpose. We should have one. Listen, it doesn't matter what your preferences are anymore. It doesn't matter what your taste is anymore. What does Jesus want in Revolution Church? What does Jesus want taught? What does Jesus want done? What's the work of the ministry that God has for this church in this community? That's all that matters. Your opinion doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't matter. Only his opinion, it's not even an opinion, it's the truth, matters. Okay, and that's where we need to stay focused. We're to be one mind, one heart with one 
purpose. And again, whose mind, whose heart, whose purpose? The Bible says in Romans 8, 29, last week I told you, we are being conformed into the image of Christ. It's Christ's mind. It's Christ's heart. It's Christ's purpose for the church. And so how do we, how do we know what that is? Well, and the, the Bible even asks in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, who can know the Lord's thoughts? We're talking about the mind of Christ. Who could know the Lord's thoughts? The next verse says we can because he's given us the mind of Christ. Yes. Yes. Like don't think about your own preference anymore. That brain that used to be in your head is supposed to be used to be. It's supposed to be gone. We've been given his mind. And what about his heart? Thinking, feeling, these are centers of emotion and thought and feeling and plan and identity. This is where this is all happening in your mind and your thoughts and your heart. Psalm 37, 4, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. The things that you used to want are in the tank, yo. You got to understand this. You're not the same anymore. Don't do what you used to do. You're not the same anymore. So we think and we feel and we do like Jesus Christ. And that first church back there in Jerusalem, it says in Acts chapter 2, because of this awe that they had, and they realized who Jesus finally was. They're like, wow, this guy's he's no game. He's, he's, he did all these things, but there were other people that kind of swelled up in popularity back then, but they kind of died off. But Jesus, he died off. For sure he died off. But three days later, he's alive hanging out talking to him, right? And so they, they were like, well, wait a minute now. I, 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 because of this, like they were in awe of this guy. And so they're like, well, I guess this is the real deal this time. So we need to take whatever life we have and we need to adjust it to his plan because every other thing didn't work. This is the only thing that's going to work. He was dead. He rose and walked through the wall to hang out with us. Let's do it his way. So, we want it. so what happened to them? Because of this awe, they were, it says that they were devoted to Jesus and to his church's mission. That, that became the most important thing of their life. Not something you add on a weekend. Not the radical Christian actually comes on Wednesday too. Ooh. And then the super freak comes on Monday to pray. Woo! No, they were devoted to Jesus and to his purposes to build his church. That was their life. And, and if there was any room left over for other stuff, then they might watch a football game. Amen. And we got it twisted. Yes, we and we got to fix that. Yes. He told them in Matthew 28 to go make disciples of every person. Imagine that. Imagine that, that, that he tells this little group of people, go make disciples of all nations. Do you think that's a part-time gig? No, no. How do you... <laughs> How does a little group like this big reach the nations, every person, with the gospel doing it 10 hours a week? How's that going to get done? But that's what we do. Yeah. And he charged his believers, you and me, to go make disciples of all nations. Why? Because he has authority. He's the boss. Nobody can tell you otherwise. Right. He said do it. Amen. And no one can tell you not to. You t if they say, hey, hey, you can't do that, you say, yeah, I can. Yeah, Jesus said I could. Who are you? Huh. Right? That's what you say. My dad could take your dad. Huh? And Jesus said, I have, I've been given authority in all heaven and all earth. So go make disciples and baptize. And we did that. Praise the Lord. And then listen, the part we miss, and then teach them all that I taught you. That's what we got to do. We got to teach people. We gotta teach people all that we've been taught. Anyone in here been taught anything? Yeah. We then teach it. Yeah. And so they were totally in on this thing. And, and I'm, pr I'm praying that God's word is powerful and that it, and when I'm sitting out here, up here talking to you this way, that it's literally, I'm just crazy enough to believe that when you're hearing this, that that same thing's gonna come out Amen. of your life. 
that you will no longer look back to, to the people in Jerusalem and go, wow, no. I, 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 my prayer is for greater things for you. I, 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 listen, I want, and I'm telling you, every leader in this church, and, and God Almighty wants people in this community to look at, at Revolution Church and go, wow. The same way we look at Jerusalem, God wants people to look at us and go, wow. Well, they're all in on that. They, they don't just phone it in or part-time this thing. Like, it's not a facade. It's not a veneer. It's real. They're completely in. They're completely in. When Robert stands before you and says, we should all come and pray, that's what I'm talking about. This is not pressure. This is truth. God wants you all in. And if you want to see the, th the results that happened then, happen now, you cannot circumvent this system. God Almighty made the system. He, he, they were devoted to this. And because they were devoted to his church, he added people to the church by the thousands. I want that. Anyone else want that? Yes. Yes. How bad? Real bad? Real bad, bad enough to, to pray every day for it? Yes. Bad enough to, to make sure that, that gathering, like they did, is in pen. Permanent ink. Amen. That giving... It says here that they gave all, they shared everything they had. They sold their stuff and they, and they gave it to the apostles and they helped the people that were in need. So, so I'm asking you something. Do you, are you, are you Listen, are you scared of the offering basket or you embrace it? I love it, yeah. right? Are you devoted to that thing to, 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 to help people and to share the gospel with the world? Are you devoted? See, that's the only, that, if you want to die happy and say our church rocked it, that's the way it gets done. No other way. No other way. I'm not creative enough, and we don't have enough money to be totally cool. So we're going to have to do it this way, guys. I hope you're in. I seen the offering plate. Right? We, we don't have it. We, we can't build some rocking awesome. There's a church I know that has, we have a little jump house that someone gave us. That's kind of cool for a church. But I, I know of a church that has, like, you know those slides that you have at, like, Chick-fil-A? They have them for the student, for the kids. You drop your kids at the counter, they go down a slide into their classroom. We can't do that. That'd be kind of cool. We're just going to have to build it on the gospel. Amen. That's just, that's all we have, right? That's all we have. So what does one mind and one heart and one purpose look like for us here? And see, the thing is, is like, I don't want to be rude to you. I love you. But your opinion doesn't matter, and neither does mine. My opinion means nothing. God's word describes what that should be. So we start here with Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, where it says this. Love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Now, you've heard that before. You've probably heard it a dozen times, if not hundreds of times. Just pause it for a second. It's not just the great commandment. It's what he wants you to do. We've got to take this thing out of the book and into our brain. He wants you to love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. He wants everyone in this room to love the Lord with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. You see where he says we're to be of one mind, right? So we all have to do that. Every single one of us has to love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. That's Paul also saying, give your bodies. That's your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Everything that you are for everything he is. That's it. That's how it starts. What's the next thing? The next verse, 38. And love your neighbor as yourself. And I, I read that. How many people have read that a hundred times? I've read that a hundred times too, right? But I read it this week and it was like, boom! I saw something. I was like, man. I, I, I don't know if this is like revelation or something, right? But I, I, I got, I was reading it. And, and, and so how many people have been taught that that you're supposed to love, like I'm supposed to love you the way um, I love myself. 
Who's, who's ever heard that? Right? Right. But here's the thing. It doesn't exactly say that in the Bible. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. So is it possible that God says, love your neighbor as you yourself have been loved? Ooh. Right? It doesn't say, it doesn't not say that, does it? It doesn't not say that. So, so maybe you love your neighbor even if you can't stand yourself. And how, do you, how does God love you? Unconditionally. He provides, extravagantly, I love that word. He provides for you. He clothes you, he feeds you, he loves you, he welcomes you, he forgives you, he has compassion for you, he cries over you, he sings over you, he forgives you, all that. And so maybe we're to love our neighbor as God has loved you. Man, can you imagine a church that lived that out alone? Just that, what that would do to a community. To love people the way God loved you. Crazy good, right? Got to let this sink in, guys. So, so how do we love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength? And how do we love our neighbor the same way that Jesus loved us? Well, if this was a secular environment, I might just say, hey, why don't you guys shout out some ideas? but we're not going to do that because this is not a secular setting. This is a sacred setting of the saints of God who are submitting to God's word. And so we just go back real quick to what we just, where we started. In the book of Acts, they did it. They were of one mind and one purpose and one heart, right? You saw that. What did that look like? It means they were devoted to God's word. That means they were in it frequently, and listen, if you're devoted to your wife, you're, you're with her a lot, right? Anyone? Okay. And you actually do some things she wants you to do, right? You're devoted to her. You're there to not only be with her, but to make her happy to provide, to take care of her, right? That's, that's what devoted is. So they weren't just devoted to the word like, we're gonna read it every day. No, devoted means we're gonna read it every day and we're gonna do it every day, Amen. right? That's, what he, that's, that's how you, you wanna, God said it, if you love me, what? Keep my commands. So we're devoted to the word of God and devoted to doing it. James said, don't be just hearers of the word, be doers of the word or else you're just deceiving yourself. You're probably not even saved if you won't do what it says because Jesus is not your Lord if you won't obey him. So, so he's like, be devoted to the word of God. That's what, that's what it looks like to, to love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. How about devoted to prayer? That's what they were doing. They were devoted to prayer. It wasn't an option. If you're devoted to your spouse, is it an option whether you come home? Is it an option whether you're faithful to him, him or her? Is it an option? No, devoted is concrete, right? Super glue. Devoted to Jesus. To love him with your mind, heart, soul, and strength meant they were devoted to his word. They were devoted to prayer. They were devoted to radical hospitality, opening up homes, sharing meals, sharing everything they had. And they were devoted to praise, to worshiping God. They were devoted to this thing. They were devoted to spending their days and nights gathering together to praise God, to sing Jesus, to sing praises to Jesus. They were devoted to that thing. And they were devoted to the Great Commission of taking all of this that they were doing and replicating it elsewhere and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and, doing it and teaching them all that you've been taught. And they were devoted to gathering to do this. Devoted to it. It wasn't optional, ever. So living a life worthy of Jesus and his gospel that saved you, giving your body to him because of all that he's done looks like this. 
being completely devoted to Jesus. Devoted to Jesus' plans, devoted to Jesus' purpose, and tossing out all of your own. Every single one of them. If they're not lined up in complete congruent with God's word, they need to go. They're holding you back from God's best. And you need to let them go. You need to let them go. Jesus didn't say for us to be creative. He said for us to be obedient. And that's what he's not, and I, I was going to say that's what he's asking for. No, that's not what he's asking for. That's what he's commanding. Do you know that it's the great commandment to love him with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength? Yes. It's not a request. It's not a suggestion. It's not, hey, why don't you fall in love with me? Let's court. No. It's a commandment. You will love me with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And heaven help us for holding on to our opinions and our priorities, yet saying Jesus is our Lord. I'm going to call the worship band back up. And as they come up to do their last song, I want to share one last section of scripture with you in closing. And it's found in Galatians chapter 6. I found this one late, real late. I was kind of done with the message. And then all of a sudden, God dropped this bomb on me. It was absolutely awesome. You know Andy was going to go in the other room. That's what he does. <laughs> Andy, we gave you one job. Awesome. Galatians chapter 6. You guys want to hear this? Okay, Galatians chapter 6. And it's just two verses, 14 and six, through 16. I'm sorry, three verses, 14 through 16. The same guy, Paul, he says, As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just think about that for just a second. Like, of all the things that you have in your life that are good, right? Certainly Paul had some good things in his life, right? And he's like, I will never boast. I will never boast or brag or, you know, go goo goo gaga and tell you guys how awesome this thing is, except one thing, the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. I could have just preached that one verse, right? That, that one half a sentence. Because, listen to this. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. The things that you used to be passionate about in this world the things that would capture your attention, the things that you would give your resources over to quickly and aggressively, Paul's like, those things need to go. Right. If, you've been, if, you, if you've been on the cross with Christ, if you've been in the tank and the preacher said, I now bury you with Christ and like him, you'll be raised to new life, then all the interests of the world that used to capture your attention and compete with, with you, with God for your loyalty, gone. Every single one. This is the cross. This is the cross. My interest in the world has been crucified, put to death. And the world's interest in me has also died. Anyone ever tell you that because you're a Christian, now the devil's after you? Have you heard that? It's true. Now imagine for a second, though, in light of what I just read to you right there, it says, because of the cross, my interest in the world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. Imagine, since you're a Christian, now the devil's after you, right? Imagine being so solid in Christ that the devil gives up. Come on, dude. Seriously. So solid, so obedient, so devoted to him that the devil goes, well, to hell with it. I can't get him anymore. He's Jesus's. I'm done. Let's go get the next guy. Imagine that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not making it. I'm, I'm just reading it right here. It says, because you have the cross, the world's interest in you is also dead. At some point, if you're completely devoted to Jesus and his mission, 
He said that, 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 that the gates of hell would not prevail. Like Jesus is going to win. The, triumph, the triumphant church is going to win. Right? And so the devil would look at you and go, you know what? I can't get him. He's beyond my reach. He's seated in the heavenlies with Jesus where I can't get him. That's you. It comes with devotion to him. He says it doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. And that was a religious thing. It didn't make you saved. It didn't make God love you more. It was just a thing that we would do to our flesh that signified something, that we were one of God's kids, one of his. But it's that he goes, it doesn't matter whether you're religious or not. It doesn't matter whether you, you go to church. It doesn't matter whether you read the Bible. It doesn't matter if you rip 10 bucks off and put it in the plate. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. Have, listen, loved ones, have you been transformed into a new creation? Th this, is when, this is introspection. This is, Lord, search my heart. Am, look around you and, and see the situation in your life. I said this last week and realized that the situation you're in was the result of your very best thinking. Do you think it's time to maybe think differently, right? Maybe think like this. Do what God says and trust that things actually do work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose. Pray for the boldness to step out and when God says do something that you're bold and say, all right, Lord, I'm stepping out of the boat, I'm coming. I may drown, but I'm going. Ask him for that. He'll give it to you. It doesn't matter about religion. What counts is whether we've been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. Listen now. They are the new people of God. Is that you? Are you going through religious ritual? Or is Jesus the Lord of your life? If he's the Lord of your life, then you're devoted, then the book of Acts, this thing in Jerusalem that we saw, the thing in Corinth, working one mind, one purpose, the people in Corinth, in Corinth, one mind, one purpose, one heart, that wouldn't be something we look at and go, oh man, that's amazing. No, that's who we would be. We would be that. God's not going to write another Bible, but we could be like first revolutionaries. Right? We could be that. We could be that. You guys could be those people. You guys could be those people. We could be that church. I don't know what other preachers are preaching at their church tomorrow morning, but this is what God wants for you. We could be that church. Completely devoted to his mission. Not tucking them into the nooks and crannies of life, but completely devoted to Jesus Christ and his purposes to seek and save that which is lost. All in, 100%. And listen, no longer being the person you used to be. No longer taking the same bait that Satan's been putting in front of your face with his fishing pole. Year after year, decade after decade, and, you're, and every single time he throws it, you bite. That person's dead. Stop taking the bait. It's time to fall in love with Jesus Christ to be in awe of Jesus Christ and to follow Jesus Christ, trusting that in so doing, the best is yet to come. That the thing that's in front of you right now that seems so appetizing and good pales in comparison to the deep dish pizza and the juicy steak that he has for you. The, the meat's dripping off the bones and we're, we're eating Big Macs. And that's what he's calling us to. Revolution, that's what he's calling this church to. Devoted to the fellowship, devoted to being here, devoted to serving, devoted to the word of God, devoted to coming and praying your guts out that he would do something awesome that we cannot. And I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop hammering this thing until I see every single one of you completely devoted to this. Because I know, I know that if you will do what this says, you will get what he promises. And that's what I want for you so bad. So please, Make a decision today, whatever today's date is. The 5th, is this August 5th? August 5th, 2017. I made a decision tonight that I'm going to be a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. 
not just saved for some, uh, some future date where it's going to be good and this is all hell. No, no, no. I'm talking about a little slice of heaven right here, right now. Right now. Because you made a decision of your will to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and completely devoted to him. He says, do something, what do you do? You do it and you trust that the best is yet to come. Amen? Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for, for, for your bold message. I thank you for your clear message. There's, there's, there's no doubt right now in this room as to what your message is for, the, for, this, for this church tonight. That you want us completely devoted to you. That you are the most important thing. That nothing else gets in the way of pursuing you and your church's growth. That's what you came for. And we're supposed to have one mind and one heart, yours. And if you're thinking about your church, and you're thinking about your bride, and you're thinking about the lost, and your heart aches and is compassionate for those who don't know who you are, then help our heart to be aching for the same. Help my thoughts and our thoughts to be thinking about you, to be thinking about each other, to love one another, to come together with one voice, laying aside all of our own personal preferences and our old history that's in the tank. Our old habits, our old plans, our old priorities, our old perspectives, our who, this is who God made me to be. No, he made you to be like Jesus and we went our other way. He wants you to be like him. Holy, righteous, compassionate, forgiving, loving, patient, gentle. Build in us the character of Christ. Help us to think like you. Help us to feel like you. Help us to love like you. And Lord, above all things, I beg you, I beg you, Father, that this message that is so from your heart would never, ever, it would ring in our ears for years. Every day. Every moment we decide we're going to go back and do what we used to do or do something that is of our desire, of the world, or of the flesh, of our eyes, but that it's not your desire, that you would remind us of what you said to us tonight. Help us to be devoted to you. On behalf of everyone here, Lord, I just want to thank you for showing up and speaking to us. We'll see you Monday night, Lord. Love you. Amen. Let's go ahead and respond in worship.